When Jason, the son of the dethroned king of Iolcos, was a little boy, he was sent away from his parents and placed under the queerest schoolmaster that ever you heard of. This learned person was one of the people, or quadrupeds, called centaurs. He lived in a cavern, and had the body and legs of a white horse, with the head and shoulders of a man. His name was Chiron, and, in spite of his odd appearance, he was a very excellent teacher, and had several scholars, who afterward did him credit by making a great figure in the world. The famous Hercules was one, and so was Achilles, and Philoctetus likewise, and Asclepius, who acquired immense repute as a doctor. The good Chiron taught his pupils how to play upon the harp, and how to cure diseases, and how to use the sword and shield, together with various other branches of education, in which the lads of those days used to be instructed instead of writing and arithmetic. I have sometimes suspected that Master Chiron was not really very different from other people, but that, being a kind-hearted and merry old fellow, he was in the habit of making believe that he was a horse, and scrambling about the schoolroom on all fours, and letting the little boys ride upon his back. And so, when his scholars had grown up and grown old, and were trotting their grandchildren on their knees, they told them about the sports of their school days, and these young folks took the idea that their grandfathers had been taught their letters by a centaur, half man and half horse. Little children, not quite understanding what is said to them, often get such absurd notions into their heads, you know. Be that as it may, it has always been told for a fact, and always will be told, as long as the world lasts, that Chiron, with the head of a schoolmaster, had the body and legs of a horse. Just imagine the grave old gentleman clattering and stamping into the schoolroom on his four hoofs, perhaps treading on some little fellow's toes, flourishing a switched tail instead of a rod, and now and then trotting out of doors to eat a mouthful of grass. I wonder what the blacksmith charged him for a set of iron shoes. So Jason dwelt in the cave, with this four-footed Chiron, from the time that he was an infant only a few months old, until he had grown to the full height of a man. He became a very good harper, I suppose, and skilful in the use of weapons, and tolerably acquainted with herbs and other doctor's stuff, and above all an admirable horseman, for, in teaching young people to ride, the good Chiron must have been without a rival among schoolmasters. At length, being now a tall and athletic youth, Jason resolved to seek his fortune in the world without asking Chiron's advice or telling him anything about the matter. This was very unwise, to be sure, and I hope none of you, my little hearers, will ever follow Jason's example. But, you are to understand, he had heard how that he himself was a prince royal, and how his father, King Eson, had been deprived of the kingdom of Iolcos by a certain Peleus, who would also have killed Jason, had he not been hidden in the centaur's cave. And, being come to the strength of a man, Jason determined to set all this business to rights, and to punish the wicked Peleus for wronging his dear father, and to cast him down from the throne and seat himself there instead. With this intention he took a spear in each hand, and threw a leopard skin over his shoulders to keep off the rain, and set forth on his travels, with his long yellow ringlets waving in the wind. The part of his dress on which he most prided himself was a pair of sandals that had been his father's. They were handsomely embroidered, and were tied upon his feet with strings of gold, but his whole attire was such as people did not very often see, and as he passed along the women and children ran to the doors and windows, wondering whither this beautiful youth was journeying, with his leopard's skin and his golden-tied sandals, and what heroic deeds he meant to perform, with a spear in his right hand and another in his left. I know not how far Jason had travelled when he came to a turbulent river, which rushed right across his pathway, with specks of white foam along its black eddies, hurrying tumultuously onward, and roaring angrily as it went. Though not a very broad river in the dry seasons of the year, it was now swollen by heavy rains and by the melting of the snow on the sides of Mount Olympus, and it thundered so loudly and looked so wild and dangerous that Jason, bold as he was, thought it prudent to pause upon the brink. The bed of the stream seemed to be strewn with sharp and rugged rocks, some of which thrust themselves above the water. By and by an uprooted tree, with shattered branches, came drifting along the current and got entangled among the rocks. Now and then a drowned sheep, and once the carcass of a cow floated past. In short, the swollen river had already done a great deal of mischief. 
It was evidently too deep for Jason to wade, and too boisterous for him to swim. He could see no bridge, and, as for a boat, had there been any, the rocks would have broken it to pieces in an instant. "'See the poor lad!' said a cracked voice close to his side. "'He must have had but a poor education, since he does not know how to cross a little stream like this. Or is he afraid of wetting his fine golden-stringed sandals? It is a pity his four-footed schoolmaster is not here to carry him safely across on his back.' Jason looked round greatly surprised, for he did not know that anybody was near. But beside him stood an old woman, with a ragged mantle over her head, leaning on a staff, the top of which was carved into the shape of a cuckoo. She looked very aged and wrinkled and infirm, and yet her eyes, which were as brown as those of an ox, were so extremely large and beautiful that when they were fixed on Jason's eyes he could see nothing else but them. The old woman had a pomegranate in her hand, although the fruit was then quite out of season. "'Whither are you going, Jason?' she now asked. She seemed to know his name, you will observe, and indeed those great brown eyes looked as if they had a knowledge of everything, whether past or to come. While Jason was gazing at her, a peacock strutted forward and took his stand at the old woman's side. "'I am going to Iolcos,' answered the young man, "'to bid the wicked King Peleus come down from my father's throne and let me reign in his stead.' "'Ah, well, then,' said the old woman, still with the same cracked voice. "'If that is all your business, you need not be in a very great hurry. Just take me on your back, there's a good youth, and carry me across the river. I and my peacock have something to do on the other side, as well as yourself.' "'Good mother,' replied Jason, "'your business can hardly be so important as the pulling down a king from his throne. Besides, as you may see for yourself, the river is very boisterous.' and if I should chance to stumble, it would sweep both of us away more easily than it has carried off yonder uprooted tree. I would gladly help you if I could, but I doubt whether I am strong enough to carry you across. Then, said she very scornfully, neither are you strong enough to pull King Peleus off his throne. And, Jason, unless you will help an old woman at her need, you ought not to be a king. What are kings made for, save to succour the feeble and distressed? But, do as you please. Either take me on your back, or with my poor old limbs I shall try my best to struggle across the stream." Saying this, the old woman poked with her staff in the river as if to find the safest place in its rocky bed where she might make the first step. But Jason by this time had grown ashamed of his reluctance to help her. He felt that he could never forgive himself if this poor feeble creature should come to any harm in attempting to wrestle against the headlong current. The good Chiron, whether half-horse or no, had taught him that the noblest use of his strength was to assist the weak, and also that he must treat every young woman as if she were his sister, and every old one like a mother. Remembering these maxims, the vigorous and beautiful young man knelt down and requested the good dame to mount upon his back. "'The passage seems to me not very safe,' he remarked, "'but as your business is so urgent, I will try to carry you across. If the river sweeps you away, it shall take me too. That, no doubt, will be a great comfort to both of us, quoth the old woman. But never fear, we shall get safely across. So she threw her arms round Jason's neck, and, lifting her from the ground, he stepped boldly into the raging and foamy current, and began to stagger away from the shore. As for the peacock, it alighted on the old dame's shoulder. Jason's two spears, one in each hand, kept him from stumbling and enabled him to feel his way among the hidden rocks, although every instant he expected that his companion and himself would go down the stream together with the driftwood of shattered trees and the carcasses of the sheep and cow. Down came the cold, snowy torrent from the steep side of Olympus, raging and thundering as if it had a real spite against Jason, or, at all events, were determined to snatch off his living burden from his shoulders. When he was halfway across, the uprooted tree, which I have already told you about, broke loose from among the rocks, and bore down upon him with all its splintered branches sticking out like the hundred arms of the giant Briareus. It rushed past, however, without touching him. But the next moment his foot was caught in a crevice between two rocks, and stuck there so fast that in the effort to get free he lost one of his golden-stringed sandals. 
at this accident jason could not help uttering a cry of vexation what is the matter jason asked the old woman matter enough said the young man i have lost a sandal here among the rocks and what sort of a figure shall i cut at the court of king peleus with a golden stringed sandal on one foot and the other foot bare do not take it too hard answered his companion cheerily you never met with better fortune than in losing that sandal it satisfies me that you are the very person whom the speaking oak has been talking about there was no time just then to inquire what the speaking oak had said but the briskness of her tone encouraged the young man and besides he had never in his life felt so vigorous and mighty as since taking this old woman on his back instead of being exhausted he gathered strength as he went on and struggling up against the torrent he at last gained the opposite shore clambered up the bank and set down the old dame and their peacock safely on the grass as soon as this was done however he could not help looking rather despondently at his bare foot with only a remnant of the golden string of the sandal clinging round his ankle you will get a handsomer pair of sandals by and by said the old woman with a kindly look out of her beautiful brown eyes only let king peleus get a glimpse of that bare foot and you shall see him turn as pale as ashes i promise you there is your path go along my good jason and my blessing go with you and when you sit on your throne remember the old woman whom you helped over the river with these words she hobbled away giving him a smile over her shoulder as she departed whether the light of her beautiful brown eyes threw a glory round about her or whatever the cause might be jason fancied that there was something very noble and majestic in her figure after all and that though her gait seemed to be a rheumatic hobble yet she moved with as much grace and dignity as any queen on earth her peacock which had now fluttered down from her shoulder strutted behind her in prodigious pomp and spread out its magnificent tail on purpose for jason to admire it when the old dame and her peacock were out of sight jason set forward on his journey after travelling a pretty long distance he came to a town situated at the foot of a mountain and not a great way from the shore of the sea on the outside of the town there was an immense crowd of people not only men and women but children too all in their best clothes and evidently enjoying a holiday the crowd was thickest toward the seashore and in that direction over the people's heads jason saw a wreath of smoke curling upward to the blue sky he inquired of one of the multitude what town it was near by and why so many persons were here assembled together this is the kingdom of iolcos answered the man and we are the subject of king peleus our monarch has summoned us together that we may see him sacrifice a black bull to neptune who they say is his majesty's father yonder is the king where you see the smoke going up from the altar while the man spoke he eyed jason with great curiosity for his garb was quite unlike that of the Iolcians, and it looked very odd to see a youth with a leopard skin over his shoulders and each hand grasping a spear. Jason perceived, too, that the man stared particularly at his feet, one of which, you remember, was bare, while the other was decorated with his father's golden-stringed sandal. "'Look at him! Only look at him!' said the man to his next neighbour. "'Do you see? He wears but one sandal!' Upon this, first one person, and then another, began to stare at Jason, and everybody seemed to be greatly struck with something in his aspect, though they turned their eyes much oftener towards his feet than to any other part of his figure. Besides, he could hear them whispering to one another. "'One sandal! One sandal!' they kept saying. "'The man with one sandal! Here he is at last! Whence has he come? What does he mean to do? What will the king say to the one-sandaled man?' Poor Jason was greatly abashed, and made up his mind that the people of Iolcos were exceedingly ill-bred to take such public notice of an accidental deficiency in his dress. Meanwhile, whether it were that they hustled him forward, or that Jason of his own accord thrust a passage through the crowd, it so happened that he soon found himself close to the smoking altar, where King Peleus was sacrificing the black bull. The murmur and hum of the multitude, in their surprise at the spectacle of Jason with his one bare foot, grew so loud that it disturbed the ceremonies, and the king, holding the great knife with which he was just going to cut the bull's throat, turned angrily about and fixed his eyes on Jason. The people had now withdrawn from around him, so that the youth stood in an open space, near the smoking altar, front to front with the angry king Peleus. "'Who are you?' cried the king, with a terrible frown. 
and how dare you make this disturbance while I am sacrificing a black bull to my father Neptune? It is no fault of mine, answered Jason. Your majesty must blame the rudeness of your subjects, who have raised all this tumult because one of my feet happens to be a bear. When Jason said this, the king gave a quick, startled glance at his feet. Ha! muttered he, here is the one-sandled fellow, sure enough. What can I do with him? And he clutched more closely the great knife in his hand, as if he were half a mind to slay Jason instead of the black bull. The people round about caught up the king's words, indistinctly as they were uttered, and first there was a murmur among them, and then a loud shout. The one-sandled man has come! The prophecy must be fulfilled! For you are to know that many years before King Peleus had been told by the speaking oak of Dodona that a man with one sandal should cast him down from his throne. On this account he had given strict orders that nobody should ever come into his presence unless both sandals were securely tied upon his feet, and he kept an officer in his palace whose sole business it was to examine people's sandals and to supply them with a new pair at the expense of the royal treasury as soon as the old ones began to wear out. In the whole course of the king's reign he had never been thrown into such a fright and agitation as by the spectacle of poor Jason's bare foot. But as he was naturally a bold and hard-hearted man, he soon took courage and began to consider in what way he might rid himself of this terrible one-sandled stranger. "'My good young man,' said King Peleus, taking the softest tone imaginable in order to throw Jason off his guard, "'you are excessively welcome to my kingdom.' Judging by your dress, you must have travelled a long distance, for it is not the fashion to wear leopard skins in this part of the world. Pray, what may I call your name, and where did you receive your education? My name is Jason, answered the young stranger. Ever since my infancy I have dwelled in the cave of Chiron the Centaur. He was my instructor, and taught me music and horsemanship, and how to cure wounds, and likewise how to inflict wounds with my weapons. I have heard of Chiron the schoolmaster, replied King Peleus, and how that there is an immense deal of learning and wisdom in his head, although it happens to be set on a horse's body. It gives me great delight to see one of his scholars at my court. But to test how much you have profited under so excellent a teacher, will you allow me to ask you a single question? I do not pretend to be very wise, said Jason, but ask me what you please, and I will answer to the best of my ability. Now King Peleus meant cunningly to entrap the young man, and to make him say something that should be the cause of mischief and destruction to himself. So, with a crafty and evil smile upon his face, he spoke as follows. "'What would you do, brave Jason?' asked he. "'If there were a man in the world by whom, as you had reason to believe, you were doomed to be ruined and slain, what would you do, I say, if that man stood before you and in your power?' When Jason saw the malice and wickedness which King Peleus could not prevent from gleaming out of his eyes, he probably guessed that the king had discovered what he came for, and that he intended to turn his own words against himself. Still, he scorned to tell a falsehood. Like an upright and honourable prince, as he was, he determined to speak out the real truth. Since the king had chosen to ask him the question, and since Jason had promised him an answer, there was no right way save to tell him precisely what would be the most prudent thing to do if he had his worst enemy in his power. Therefore, after a moment's consideration, he spoke up with a firm and manly voice. "'I would send such a man,' said he, "'in quest of the golden fleece.' This enterprise, you will understand, was, of all others, the most difficult and dangerous in the world. In the first place, it would be necessary to make a long voyage through unknown seas, there was hardly a hope or a possibility that any young man who should undertake this voyage would either succeed in obtaining the golden fleece, or would survive to return home and tell of the perils he had run. The eyes of King Peleus sparkled with joy, therefore, when he heard Jason's reply. "'Well said, wise man with the one sandal,' cried he. "'Go, then, and at the peril of your life bring me back the golden fleece.' "'I go,' answered Jason composedly. If I fail, you need not fear that I will ever come back to trouble you again. But if I return to Iolcos with the prize, then, King Peleus, you must hasten down from your lofty throne and give me your crown and sceptre. That I will, said the king, with a sneer. 
Meantime, I will keep them very safely for you. The first thing that Jason thought of doing after he left the king's presence was to go to Dodona and inquire of the talking oak what course it was best to pursue. This wonderful tree stood in the centre of an ancient wood. Its stately trunk rose up a hundred feet into the air and threw a broad and dense shadow over more than an acre of ground. Standing beneath it, Jason looked up among the knotted branches and green leaves and into the mysterious heart of the old tree, and spoke aloud as if he were addressing some person who was hidden in the depths of the foliage. "'What shall I do?' said he, "'in order to win the golden fleece.' At first there was a deep silence, not only within the shadow of the talking oak, but all through the solitary wood. In a moment or two, however, the leaves of the oak began to stir and rustle as if a gentle breeze were wandering among them, although the other trees of the wood were perfectly still. The sound grew louder and became like the roar of a high wind. By and by, Jason imagined that he could distinguish words, but very confusedly, because each separate leaf of the tree seemed to be a tongue, and the whole myriad of tongues were babbling at once. But the noise waxed broader and deeper, until it resembled a tornado sweeping through the oak, and making one great utterance out of the thousand and thousand of little murmurs which each leafy tongue had caused by its rustling. And now, though it still had the tone of a mighty wind roaring among the branches, it was also like a deep bass voice speaking, as distinctly as a tree could be expected to speak, the following words. "'Go to Argus, the shipbuilder, and bid him build a galley with fifty oars.' Then the voice melted again into the indistinct murmur of the rustling leaves, and died gradually away. When it was quite gone, Jason felt inclined to doubt whether it actually heard the words, or whether his fancy had not shaped them out of the ordinary sound made by a breeze while passing through the thick foliage of the tree. But on inquiry among the people of Iolcos, he found that there was really a man in the city by the name of Argus, who was a very skilful builder of vessels. This showed some intelligence in the oak, else how should it have known that any such person existed? At Jason's request, Argus readily consented to build him a galley so big that it should require fifty strong men to row it, although no vessel of such a size and burden had heretofore been seen in the world. So the head carpenter and all his journeymen and apprentices began their work, and for a good while afterward there they were, busily employed, hewing out the timbers and making a great clatter with their hammers, until the new ship, which was called the Argo, seemed to be quite ready for sea. And as the talking oak had already given him such good advice, Jason thought that it would not be amiss to ask for a little more. He visited it again, therefore, and standing beside its huge, rough trunk, inquired what he should do next. This time there was no such universal quivering of the leaves throughout the whole tree as there had been before. But after a while Jason observed that the foliage of a great branch, which stretched above his head, had begun to rustle as if the wind were stirring that one bough, while all the other boughs of the oak were at rest. "'Cut me off,' said the branch, as soon as it could speak distinctly. "'Cut me off! Cut me off! And carve me into a figurehead for your galley!' Accordingly, Jason took the branch at its word and lopped it off the tree. A carver in the neighborhood engaged to make the figurehead. He was a tolerably good workman and had already carved several figureheads in what he intended for feminine shapes, and looking pretty much like those which we see nowadays stuck up under a vessel's bowsprit, with great staring eyes that never wink at the dash of the spray. But, what was very strange, the carver found that his hand was guided by some unseen power and by a skill beyond his own, and that his tools shaped out an image which he had never dreamt of. When the work was finished, it turned out to be the figure of a beautiful woman, with a helmet on her head, from beneath which the long ringlets fell down upon her shoulders. On the left arm was a shield, and in its centre appeared a lifelike representation of the head of Medusa, with a snaky locks. The right arm was extended as if pointed onward. The face of this wonderful statue, though not angry or forbidding, was so grave and majestic that perhaps you might call it severe, and as for the mouth, it seemed just ready to unclose its lips and utter words of the deepest wisdom. Jason was delighted with the oaken image, and gave the carver no rest until it was completed 
and set up where a figurehead has always stood, from that time to this, in the vessel's prow. "'And now,' cried he, as he stood gazing at the calm, majestic face of the statue, "'I must go to the talking oak and inquire what next to do.' "'There is no need of that, Jason,' said a voice which, though it was far lower, reminded him of the mighty tones of the great oak. "'When you desire good advice, you can seek it of me.' Jason had been looking straight into the face of the image when these words were spoken, but he could hardly believe either his ears or his eyes. The truth was, however, that the oaken lips had moved, and to all appearance the voice had proceeded from the statue's mouth. Recovering a little from his surprise, Jason bethought himself that the image had been carved out of the wood of the talking oak, and that, therefore, it was really no great wonder, but, on the contrary, the most natural thing in the world, that it should possess the faculty of speech. It should have been very odd indeed if it had not. But certainly it was a great piece of good fortune that he should be able to carry so wise a block of wood along with him in his perilous voyage. "'Tell me, wondrous image,' exclaimed Jason, "'since you inherit the wisdom of the speaking oak of Dodona, whose daughter you are,' Tell me, where shall I find fifty bold youths who will take each of them an oar of my galley? They must have sturdy arms to row, and brave hearts to encounter perils, or we shall never win the golden fleece. Go, replied the oaken image, go, summon all the heroes of Greece. And, in fact, considering what a great deed was to be done, could any advice be wiser than this which Jason received from the figurehead of his vessel? He lost no time in sending messengers to all the cities, and making known to the whole people of Greece that Prince Jason, the son of King Eson, was going in quest of the fleece of gold, and he desired the help of forty-nine of the bravest and strongest young men alive to row his vessel and share his dangers, and Jason himself would be the fiftieth. At this news the adventurous youths all over the country began to bestir themselves. Some of them had already fought with giants and slain dragons, and the younger ones, who had not yet met with such good fortune, thought it a shame to have lived so long without getting astride of a flying serpent, or sticking their spears into a chimera, or at least thrusting their right arms down a monstrous lion's throat. There was a fair prospect that they would meet with plenty of such adventures before finding the golden fleece. As soon as they could furbish up their helmets and shields, therefore, and gird on their trusty swords, they came thronging to Iolcos, and clambered on board the new galley. Shaking hands with Jason, they assured him that they did not care a pin for their lives, but would help row the vessel to the remotest edge of the world, and as much further as he think it best to go. Many of these brave fellows had been educated by Chiron, the four-footed pedagogue, and were therefore old schoolmates of Jason, and knew him to be a lad of spirit. The mighty Hercules, whose shoulders afterward held up the sky, was one of them and there were Castor and Pollux, the twin brothers, who were never accused of being chicken-hearted, although they had been hatched out of an egg, and Theseus, who was so renowned for killing the Minotaur, and Lynceus, with his wonderfully sharp eyes, which could see through a millstone or look right down into the depths of the earth and discover the treasures that were there, and Orpheus, the very best of harpers, who sang and played upon his lyre so sweetly that the brute beasts stood upon their hind legs and capered merrily to the music. Yes, and at some of his more moving tunes the rocks bestirred their moss-grown bulk out of the ground, and a grove of forest trees uprooted themselves, and, nodding their tops to one another, performed a country dance. One of the rowers was a beautiful young woman named Atalanta, who had been nursed among the mountains by a bear. So light of foot was this fair damsel that she could step from one foamy crest of a wave to the foamy crest of another without wetting more than the sole of her sandal. She had grown up in a very wild way and talked much about the rights of women and loved hunting and war far better than her needle. But in my opinion the most remarkable of this famous company were two sons of the north wind, airy youngsters and of rather a blustering disposition, who had wings on their shoulders and, in case of a calm, could puff out their cheeks and blow almost as fresh a breeze as their father. I ought not to forget the prophets and conjurers, of whom there were several in the crew, and who could foretell what would happen to-morrow, or the next day, or a hundred years hence, but were generally quite unconscious of what was passing at the moment. Jason appointed Typhus to be helmsman, 
because he was a stargazer and knew the points of the compass. Lincius, on account of his sharp sight, was stationed as a lookout in the prow, where he saw a whole day's sail ahead, but was rather apt to overlook things that lay directly under his nose. If the sea only happened to be deep enough, however, Lincius could tell you exactly what kind of rocks or sands were at the bottom of it, and he often cried out to his companions that they were sailing over heaps of sunken treasure, which yet he was none the richer for beholding. To confess the truth, few people believed him when he said it. Well, but when the Argonauts, as these fifty brave adventurers were called, had prepared everything for the voyage, an unforeseen difficulty threatened to end it before it was begun. The vessel, you must understand, was so long and broad and ponderous that the united force of all the fifty was insufficient to shove her into the water. Hercules, I suppose, had not grown to his full strength, else he might have set her afloat as easily as a little boy launches his boat upon a puddle. But here were these fifty heroes, pushing and straining and growing red in the face, without making the Argo start an inch. At last, quite wearied out, they set themselves down on the shore, exceedingly disconsolate, and thinking that the vessel must be left to rot and fall in pieces, and that they must either swim across the sea or lose the golden fleece. All at once, Jason bethought himself of the galley's miraculous figurehead. "'O oh, daughter of the talking oak!' cried he. "'How shall we set to work to get our vessel into the water?' "'See to yourselves,' answered the image, for it had known what had ought to be done from the very first, and was only waiting for the question to be put. "'See to yourselves, and handle your oars, and let Orpheus play upon his harp.' Immediately the fifty heroes got on board, and seizing their oars, held them perpendicularly in the air, while Orpheus, who liked such task far better than rowing, swept his fingers across the harp. At the first ringing note of the music they felt the vessel stir. Orpheus thrummed away briskly, and the galley slid at once into the sea, dipping her prow so deeply that the figurehead drank the wave with its marvellous lips, and rising again as buoyant as a swan. The rowers plied their fifty oars, the white foam boiled up before the prow, the water gurgled and bubbled in their wake, while Orpheus continued to play so lively a strain of music that the vessel seemed to dance over the billows by way of keeping time to it. Thus triumphantly did the Argo sail out of the harbour amid the huzzas and good wishes of everybody except the wicked old Peleus, who stood on a promontory scowling at her, and wishing that he could blow out of his lungs the tempest of wrath that was in his heart, and so sink the galley with all on board. When they had sailed above fifty miles over the sea, Lincius happened to cast his sharp eyes behind, and said that there was this bad-hearted king, still perched upon the promontory, and scowling so gloomily that it looked like a black thundercloud in that quarter of the horizon. In order to make the time pass away more pleasantly during the voyage, the heroes talked about the Golden Fleece. It originally belonged, it appears, to a Boeotian ram, who had taken on his back two children, when in danger of their lives, and fled with them over land and sea as far as Colchis. One of the children, whose name was Helly, fell into the sea and was drowned. But the other, a little boy named Phrixus, was brought safe ashore by the faithful ram, who, however, was so exhausted that he immediately lay down and died. In memory of this good deed, and as a token of his true heart, the fleece of the poor dead ram was miraculously changed to gold, and became one of the most beautiful objects ever seen on earth. It was hung upon a tree in a sacred grove, where it had now been kept I know not how many years, and was the envy of mighty kings, who had nothing so magnificent in any of their palaces. If I were to tell you all the adventures of the Argonauts, it would take me till nightfall, and perhaps a great deal longer. There was no lack of wonderful events, as you may judge from what you have already heard, at a certain island they were hospitably received by King Sisychus, its sovereign, who made a feast for them and treated them like brothers. But the Argonauts saw that this good king looked downcast and very much troubled, and they therefore inquired of him what was the matter. King Sisychus hereupon informed them that he and his subjects were greatly abused and incommoded by the inhabitants of a neighbouring mountain, who made war upon them and killed many people and ravaged the country and while they were talking about it, Siscus pointed to the mountain, and asked Jason and his companion what they saw there. "'I see some very tall objects,' answered Jason, "'but they are at such a distance that I cannot distinctly make out what they are. 
To tell your majesty the truth, they look so very strangely that I am inclined to think them clouds which have chanced to take something like human shapes. I see them very plainly, remarked Lincius, whose eyes, you know, were as far-sighted as a telescope. They are a band of enormous giants, all of whom have six arms apiece, and a club, a sword, or some other weapon in each of their hands. You have excellent eyes, said King Sisychus. Yes, they are six-armed giants, as you say, and these are the enemies whom I and my subjects have to contend with. The next day, when the Argonauts were about setting sail, down came these terrible giants, stepping a hundred yards at a stride, brandishing their six arms apiece, and looking very formidable so far aloft in the air. Each of these monsters was able to carry on a whole war by himself, for with one of his arms he could fling immense stones, and wield a club with another, and a sword with a third, while the fourth was poking a long spear at the enemy, and the fifth and the sixth were shooting him with a bow and arrow. But luckily, though the giants were so huge and had so many arms, they had each but one heart, and that no bigger nor braver than the heart of an ordinary man. Besides, if they had been like the hundred-armed Briarius, the brave Argonauts would have given them their hands full of fight. Jason and his friends went boldly to meet them, slew a great many, and made the rest take to their heels, so that if the giants had had six legs apiece instead of six arms, it would have served them better to run away with. Another strange adventure happened when the voyagers came to Thrace, where they found a poor blind king named Phineas, deserted by his subjects, and living in a very sorrowful way all by himself. On Jason's inquiring whether they could do him any service, the king answered that he was terribly tormented by three great winged creatures called harpies, which had the faces of women and the wings, bodies, and claws of vultures. These ugly wretches were in the habit of snatching away his dinner, and allowed him no peace of his life. Upon hearing this, the Argonauts spread a plentiful feast on the seashore, well knowing from what the blind king said of their greediness that the harpies would snuff up the scent of the victuals and quickly come to steal them away. And so it turned out, for hardly was the table set, before the three hideous vulture women came flapping their wings, seized the food in their talons, and flew off as fast as they could. But the two sons of the north wind drew their swords, spread their pinions, and set off through the air in pursuit of the thieves, whom they at last overtook among some islands, after a chase of hundreds of miles. The two winged youths blustered terribly at the harpies, for they had the rough temper of their father, and so frightened them with their drawn swords that they solemnly promised never to trouble King Phineas again. Then the Argonauts sailed onward, and met with many other marvellous incidents, any one of which would make a story by itself. At one time they landed on an island and were reposing on the grass, when they suddenly found themselves assailed by what seemed a shower of steel-headed arrows. Some of them stuck in the ground, while others hit against their shields, and several penetrated their flesh. The fifty heroes started up and looked about them for the hidden enemy, but could find none nor see any spot on the whole island where even a single archer could lie concealed. Still, however, the steel-headed arrows came whizzing among them, and at last, Happening to look upward, they beheld a large flock of birds, hovering and wheeling aloft, and shooting their feathers down upon the Argonauts. These feathers were the steel-headed arrows that had so tormented them. There was no possibility of making any resistance, and the fifty heroic Argonauts might all have been killed or wounded by a flock of troublesome birds without ever setting eyes on the golden fleece, if Jason had not thought of asking the advice of the oaken image so he ran to the galley as fast as his legs would carry him. "'Oh, daughter of the speaking oak!' cried he, all out of breath. "'We need your wisdom more than ever before. We are in great peril from a flock of birds who are shooting us with their steel-pointed feathers. What can we do to drive them away?' "'Make a clatter on your shields,' said the image. On receiving this excellent counsel, Jason hurried back to his companions, who were far more dismayed than when they fought with the six-armed giants, and bade them strike with their swords upon their brazen shields. Forthwith the fifty heroes set heartily to work, banging with might and main, and raised such a terrible clatter that the birds made what haste they could to get away, and though they had shot half the feathers out of their wings, they were soon seen skimming among the clouds, a long distance off, and looking like a flock of wild geese. 
Orpheus celebrated this victory by playing a triumphant anthem on his harp, and sang so melodiously that Jason begged him to desist, lest, as the steel-feathered birds had been driven away by an ugly sound, they might be enticed back again by a sweet one. While the Argonauts remained on this island, they saw a small vessel approaching the shore, in which were two young men of princely demeanour and exceedingly handsome, as young princes generally were in those days. Now, who do you imagine these two voyagers turned out to be? Why, if you will believe me, they were the sons of that very Phrixus, who in his childhood had been carried to Colchis on the back of the golden-fleeced ram. Since that time Phrixus had married the king's daughter, and the two young princes had been born and brought up at Colchis, and had spent their playdays on the outskirts of the grove, in the centre of which the golden fleece was hanging upon a tree. They were now on their way to Greece, in hopes of getting back a kingdom that had been wrongfully taken from their father. When the princes understood whither the Argonauts were going, they offered to turn back and guide them to Colgis. At the same time, however, they spoke as if it were very doubtful whether Jason would succeed in getting the Golden Fleece. According to their account, the tree on which it hung was guarded by a terrible dragon, who never failed to devour at one mouthful every person who might venture within his reach. "'There are other difficulties in the way,' continued the young princess. "'But is not this enough?' Ah, brave Jason, turn back before it is too late. It would grieve us to the heart if you and your forty-nine brave companions should be eaten up at fifty mouthfuls by this execrable dragon. My young friends, quietly replied Jason, I do not wonder that you think the dragon very terrible. You have grown up from infancy in the fear of this monster, and therefore still regard him with the awe that children feel for the bugbears and hobgoblins which their nurses have talked to them about. But in my view of the matter, the dragon is merely a pretty large serpent who is not half so likely to snap me up at one mouthful as I am to cut off his ugly head and strip the skin from his body. At all events, turn back who may, I will never see Greece again unless I carry with me the golden fleece. "'We will none of us turn back,' cried his forty-nine brave comrades. "'Let us get on board the galley this instant, and if the dragon is to make a breakfast of us, much good may it do him.' and Orpheus, whose custom it was to set everything to music, began to harp and sing most gloriously, and made every mother's son of them feel as if nothing in this world were so delectable as to fight dragons, and nothing so truly honourable as to be eaten up at one mouthful in case of the worst. After this, being now under the guidance of the two princes, who were well acquainted with the way, they quickly sailed to Colgis. When the king of the country, whose name was Aetis, heard of their arrival, he instantly summoned Jason to court. The king was a stern and cruel-looking potentate, and though he put on as polite and hospitable an expression as he could, Jason did not like his face a whit better than that of the wicked King Peleus, who dethroned his father. "'You are welcome, brave Jason,' said King Aetis. "'Pray, are you on a pleasure voyage? Or do you meditate the discovery of unknown islands?' or what other cause has procured me the happiness of seeing you at my court? "'Great sir,' replied Jason, with an obeisance, for Chiron had taught him how to behave with propriety, whether to kings or beggars. "'I have come hither with a purpose which I now beg your majesty's permission to execute. King Peleus, who sits on my father's throne, to which he has no more right than to the one on which your excellent majesty is now seated, has engaged to come down from it and to give me his crown and sceptre, provided I bring him the golden fleece. This, as your majesty is aware, is now hanging on a tree here at Colgis, and I humbly solicit your gracious leave to take it away. In spite of himself, the king's face twisted itself into an angry frown, for above all things else in the world he prized the golden fleece, and was even suspected of having done a very wicked act in order to get it into his own possession. It put him into the worst possible humour, therefore, to hear that the gallant Prince Jason and forty-nine of the bravest young warriors of Greece had come to Colgis with the sole purpose of taking away his chief treasure. "'Do you know,' asked King Aetis, eyeing Jason very sternly, "'what are the conditions which you must fulfil before getting possession of the Golden Fleece?' "'I have heard,' rejoined the youth, that a dragon lies beneath the tree on which the prize hangs, and that whoever approaches him runs the risk of being devoured at a mouthful. True, said the king, with a smile that did not look particularly good-natured. 
Very true, young man. But there are other things as hard, or perhaps a little harder, to be done before you can even have the privilege of being devoured by the dragon. For example, you must first tame my two brazen-footed and brazen-lunged bulls, which Vulcan, the wonderful blacksmith, made for me. There is a furnace in each of their stomachs, and they breathe such hot fire out of their mouths and nostrils that nobody has hitherto gone nigh them without being instantly burned to a small black cinder. What do you think of this, my brave Jason? I must encounter the peril, answered Jason, composedly, since it stands in the way of my purpose. After taming the fiery bulls, continued King Aetis, who was determined to scare Jason if possible, you must yoke them to a plough, and must plough the sacred earth in the grove of Mars, and sow some of the same dragon's teeth from which Cadmus raised the crop of armed men. They are an unruly set of reprobates, those sons of the dragon's teeth, and unless you treat them suitably, they will fall upon you sword in hand. You and your forty-nine Argonauts, my bold Jason, are hardly numerous or strong enough to fight with such a host as will spring up. My master Chiron, replied Jason, taught me long ago the story of Cadmus. Perhaps I can manage the quarrelsome sons of the dragon's teeth as well as Cadmus did. I wish the dragon had him, muttered King Aetis to himself, and the four-footed pedant, his schoolmaster, into the bargain. Why, what a foolhardy, self-conceited coxcomb he is! We'll see what my fire-breathing bulls will do for him. Well, Prince Jason, he continued aloud, and as complacently as he could. Make yourself comfortable for today, and tomorrow morning, since you insist upon it, you shall try your skill at the plough. While the king talked with Jason, a beautiful young woman was standing behind the throne. She fixed her eyes earnestly upon the youthful stranger, and listened attentively to every word that was spoken, and when Jason withdrew from the king's presence, this young woman followed him out of the room. "'I am the king's daughter,' she said to him and my name is Medea. I know a great deal of which other young princesses are ignorant, and can do many things which they would be afraid so much as to dream of. If you will trust to me, I can instruct you how to tame the fiery bulls, and sow the dragon's teeth, and get the golden fleece. Indeed, beautiful princess, answered Jason, if you will do me this service, I promise to be grateful to you my whole life long. Gazing at Medea, he beheld a wonderful intelligence in her face. She was one of those persons whose eyes are full of mystery, so that while looking into them you seem to see a very great way, as into a deep well, yet can be never certain whether you see into the furthest depth or whether there be not something else hidden at the bottom. If Jason had been capable of fearing anything, he would have been afraid of making this young princess his enemy, for, beautiful as she now looked, she might the very next instant become as terrible as the dragon that kept watch over the golden fleece. Princess, he exclaimed, you seem indeed very wise and very powerful, but how can you help me to do the things of which you speak? Are you an enchantress? Yes, Prince Jason, answered Medea with a smile. You have hit upon the truth. I am an enchantress. Circe, my father's sister, taught me to be one, and I could tell you, if I pleased, who was the old woman with the peacock, and pomegranate, and the cuckoo staff, whom you carried over the river, and likewise, who it is that speaks through the lips of the oaken image that stands in the prow of your galley. I am acquainted with some of your secrets, you perceive. It is well for you that I am favourably inclined, for otherwise you would hardly escape being snapped up by the dragon. I should not so much care for the dragon, replied Jason if I only knew how to manage the brazen-footed and fiery-lunged bulls. "'If you are as brave as I think you, and as you have need to be,' said Medea, "'your own bold heart will teach you that there is but one way of dealing with a mad bull. What it is, I leave you to find out in the moment of peril. As for the fiery breath of these animals, I have a charmed ointment here, which will prevent you from being burned up and cure you if you chance to be a little scorched.' So she put a golden box into his hand, and directed him how to apply the perfumed unguent which it contained, and where to meet her at midnight. "'Only be brave,' added she, "'and before daybreak the brazen bulls shall be tamed.' The young man assured her that his heart would not fail him. 
He then rejoined his comrades, and told them what had passed between the princess and himself, and warned them to be in readiness in case there might be need of their help. At the appointed hour he met the beautiful Medea on the marble steps of the king's palace. She gave him a basket, in which were the dragon's teeth, just as they had been pulled out of the monster's jaws by Cadmus long ago. Medea then led Jason down the palace steps, and through the silent streets of the city, and into the royal pasture-ground, where the two brazen-footed bulls were kept. It was a starry night, with a bright gleam along the eastern edge of the sky, where the moon was soon going to show herself. After entering the pasture, the princess paused and looked around. "'There they are,' said she, "'reposing themselves and chewing their fiery cuts in that furthest corner of the field. It will be excellent sport, I assure you, when they catch a glimpse of your figure.' My father and all his court delight in nothing so much as to see a stranger trying to yoke them in order to come by the Golden Fleece. It makes a holiday in Colgis whenever such a thing happens. For my part, I enjoy it immensely. You cannot imagine in what a mere twinkling of an eye their hot breath shrivels a young man into a black cinder. "'Are you sure, beautiful Medea?' asked Jason. "'Quite sure that the ungent in the gold box?' will prove a remedy against those terrible burns. "'If you doubt, if you are in the least afraid,' said the princess, looking him in the face by the dim starlight, "'we had better never have been born than go a step nigher to the bulls.' But Jason had set his heart steadfastly on getting the golden fleece, and I positively doubt whether he would have gone back without it, even had he been certain of finding himself turned into a red-hot cinder, or a handful of white ashes, the instant he made a step further. He therefore let go Medea's hand, and walked boldly forward in the direction whither she had pointed. At some distance before him he perceived four streams of fiery vapour, regularly appearing and again vanishing after dimly lighting up the surrounding obscurity. These, you will understand, were caused by the breath of the brazen bulls, which was quietly stealing out of their four nostrils as they lay chewing their cuds. At the first two or three steps which Jason made, the four fiery streams appeared to gush out somewhat more plentifully, for the two brazen bulls had heard his foot-tramp, and were lifting up their hot noses to snuff the air. He went a little further, and by the way in which the red vapour now spouted forth, he judged that the creatures had got upon their feet. Now he could see glowing sparks and vivid jets of flame. At the next step, each of the bulls made the pasture echo with a terrible roar, while the burning breath which they thus belched forth lit up the whole field with a momentary flash. One other stride did bold Jason make, and suddenly, as a streak of lightning, on came these fiery animals, roaring like thunder and sending out sheets of white flame, which so kindled up the scene that the young man could discern every object more distinctly than by daylight. Most distinctly of all, he saw the two horrible creatures galloping right down upon him, their brazen hoofs rattling and ringing over the ground, and their tails sticking up stiffly into the air, as has always been the fashion with angry bulls. Their breath scorched the herbage before them. So intensely hot it was, indeed, that it caught a dry tree under which Jason was now standing, and set it all in a light blaze. But as for Jason himself, thanks to Medea's enchanted ointment, the white flame curled around his body without injuring him a jot more than if he had been made of asbestos. Greatly encouraged at finding himself not yet turned into a cinder, the young man awaited the attack of the bulls. Just as the brazen brutes fancied themselves sure of tossing him into the air, he caught one of them by the horn and the other by his screwed-up tail and held them in a grip like that of an iron vice, one with his right hand, the other with his left. Well, he must have been wonderfully strong in his arms, to be sure. But the secret of the matter was that the brazen bulls were enchanted creatures, and that Jason had broken the spell of their fiery fierceness by his bold way of handling them. And ever since that time it has been the favourite method of brave men, when danger assails them, to do what they call taking the bull by the horns, and to grip him by the tail is pretty much the same thing, that is, to throw aside fear and overcome the peril by despising it. It was now easy to yoke the bulls and to harness them to the plough which had lain rusting on the ground for a great many years gone by, so long was it before anybody could be found capable of ploughing that piece of land. Jason, I suppose, had been taught how to draw a furrow by the good old Chiron, 
who, perhaps, used to allow himself to be harnessed to the plough. At any rate, our hero succeeded perfectly well in breaking up the greensward, and by the time that the moon was a quarter of her journey up the sky, the ploughed field lay before him, a large tract of black earth, ready to be sown with the dragon's teeth. So Jason scattered them broadcast, and harrowed them into the soil with a brush harrow, and took his stand on the edge of the field, anxious to see what would happen next. "'Must we wait long for harvest time?' he inquired of Medea, who was now standing by his side. "'Whether sooner or later, it will be sure to come,' answered the princess. "'A crop of armed men never fails to spring up when the dragon's teeth have been sown.' The moon was now high aloft in the heavens, and threw its bright beams over the ploughed field, where as yet there was nothing to be seen. Any farmer, on viewing it, would have said that Jason must wait weeks before the green blades would peep from among the clods, and whole months before the yellow grain would be ripened for the sickle. But by and by, all over the field, there was something that glistened in the moonbeams like sparkling drops of dew. These bright objects sprouted higher, and proved to be the steel heads of spears. Then there was a dazzling gleam from a vast number of polished brass helmets, beneath which, as they grew further out of the soil, appeared the dark and bearded visages of warriors, struggling to free themselves from the imprisoning earth. The first look that they gave at the upper world was a glare of wrath and defiance. Next were seen their bright breastplates. In every right hand there was a sword or a spear, and on each left arm a shield, and when this strange crop of warriors had but half grown out of the earth, they struggled, such was their impatience of restraint, and, as it were, tore themselves up by the roots. Wherever a dragon's tooth had fallen, there stood a man armed for battle. They made a clangor with their swords against their shields, and eyed one another fiercely, for they had come into this beautiful world, and into the peaceful moonlight, full of rage and stormy passions, and ready to take the life of every human brother in recompense for the boon of their own existence. There have been many other armies in the world that seemed to possess the same fierce nature with the one which had now sprouted from the dragon's teeth, but these in the moonlit field were the more excusable, because they never had women for their mothers. And now it would have rejoiced any great captain who was bent on conquering the world, like Alexander or Napoleon, to raise a crop of armed soldiers as easily as Jason did. For a while the warriors stood flourishing their weapons, clashing their swords against their shields, and boiling over with the red-hot thirst for battle. Then they began to shout, "'Show us the enemy! Lead us to the charge! Death or victory! Come on, brave comrades! Conquer or die!' And a hundred other outcries, such as men always bellow forth on a battlefield, and which these dragon people seem to have at their tongue's ends. At last the front rank caught sight of Jason, who, beholding the flash of so many weapons in the moonlight, had thought it best to draw his sword. In a moment all the sons of the dragon's teeth appeared to take Jason for an enemy, and crying with one voice, "'Guard the golden fleece!' they ran at him with uplifted swords and protruded spears. Jason knew that it would be impossible to withstand this bloodthirsty battalion with a single arm, but determined, since there was nothing better to be done, to die as valiantly as if he himself had sprung from a dragon's tooth. Medea, however, bade him snatch up a stone from the ground. "'Throw it among them, quickly!' cried she. "'It is the only way to save yourself.' The armed men were now so nigh that Jason could discern the fire flashing out of their enraged eyes when he let fly the stone and saw it strike the helmet of a tall warrior who was rushing upon him with his blade aloft. The stone glanced from this man's helmet to the shield of his nearest comrade, and thence flew right into the angry face of another, hitting him smartly between the eyes. Each of the three, who had been struck by the stone, took it for granted that his next neighbour had given him a blow, and instead of running any further toward Jason, they began to fight among themselves. The confusion spread through the host, so that it seemed scarcely a moment before they were all hacking, hewing, and stabbing at one another, lopping off arms, heads, and legs, and doing such memorable deeds that Jason was filled with immense admiration, although, at the same time, he could not help laughing to behold these mighty men punishing each other for an offence which he himself had committed. In an incredibly short space of time, almost as short indeed as it had taken them to grow up, all but one of the heroes of the dragon's teeth were stretched lifeless on the field. 
the last survivor, the bravest and strongest of the whole, had just force enough to wave his crimson sword over his head and give a shout of exultation, crying, Victory! Victory! Immortal fame! When he himself fell down and lay quietly among his slain brethren. And there was the end of the army that had sprouted from the dragon's teeth. That fierce and feverish fight was the only enjoyment which they had tasted on this beautiful earth. "'Let them sleep in the bed of honour," said the Princess Medea, with a sly smile at Jason. "'The world will always have simpletons enough, just like them, fighting and dying, for they know not what, and fancying that posterity will take the trouble to put laurel wreaths upon their rusty and battered helmets. Could you help smiling, Prince Jason, to see the self-conceit of that last fellow, just as he tumbled down?' "'It made me very sad,' answered Jason gravely. "'And to tell you the truth, Princess, the Golden Fleece does not appear so well worth the winning after what I have here beheld.' "'You will think differently in the morning,' said Medea. "'True, the Golden Fleece may not be so valuable as you have thought it, but then there is nothing better in the world, and one must needs have an object, you know. Come, your night's work has been well performed, and to-morrow you can inform King Aetes that the first part of your allotted task is fulfilled. Agreeably to Medea's advice, Jason went betimes in the morning to the palace of King Aetes. Entering the presence chamber, he stood at the foot of the throne and made a low obeisance. "'Your eyes look heavy, Prince Jason,' observed the king. "'You appear to have spent a sleepless night. I hope you have been considering the matter a little more wisely, and have concluded not to get yourself scorched to a cinder in attempting to tame my brazen-lunged bulls.' "'That is already accomplished, may it please your majesty,' replied Jason. "'The bulls have been tamed and yoked. The field has been ploughed. The dragon's teeth have been sown broadcast and harrowed into the soil.' The crop of armed warriors has sprung up, and they have slain one another to the last man. And now I solicit your majesty's permission to encounter the dragon, that I may take down the golden fleece from the tree, and depart with my forty-nine comrades. King Aetes scowled, and looked very angry, and excessively disturbed, for he knew that, in accordance with his kingly promise, he ought now to permit Jason to win the fleece, if his courage and skill should enable him to do so. But since the young man had met with such good luck in the matter of the brazen bulls and dragon's teeth, the king feared that he would be equally successful in slaying the dragon. And therefore, though he would gladly have seen Jason snapped up at a mouthful, he was resolved, and it was a very wrong thing of this wicked potentate, not to run any further risk of losing his beloved fleece. "'You never would have succeeded in this business, young man,' said he if my undutiful daughter Medea had not helped you with her enchantments. Had you acted fairly, you would have been at this instant a black cinder or a handful of white ashes. I forbid you, on pain of death, to make any more attempts to get the golden fleece. To speak my mind plainly, you shall never set eyes on so much as one of its glistening locks. Jason left the king's presence in great sorrow and anger. He could think of nothing better to be done than to summon together his forty-nine brave Argonauts, march at once to the Grove of Mars, slay the dragon, take possession of the Golden Fleece, get on board the Argo, and spread all sails for Iolcos. The success of this scheme depended, it is true, on the doubtful point whether all the fifty heroes might not be snapped up as so many mouthfuls by the dragon. But as Jason was hastening down the palace steps, the Princess Medea called after him and beckoned him to return. Her black eyes shone upon him with such a keen intelligence that he felt as if there were a serpent peeping out of them, and although she had done him so much service only the night before, he was by no means very certain that she would not do him an equally great mischief before sunset. These enchantresses, you must know, are never to be dependent upon. "'What says King Aetes, my royal and upright father?' inquired Medea, slightly smiling. Will he give you the golden fleece without any further risk or trouble? On the contrary, answered Jason, he is very angry with me for taming the brazen bulls and sowing the dragon's teeth, and he forbids me to make any more attempts, and positively refuses to give up the golden fleece, whether I slay the dragon or no. Yes, Jason, said the princess, and I can tell you more. Unless you set sail from Colchis before to-morrow's sunrise, the king means to burn your fifty-oared galley, 
and put yourself and your forty-nine brave comrades to the sword. But be of good courage. The golden fleece you shall have, if it lies within the power of my enchantments to get it for you. Wait for me here an hour before midnight. At the appointed hour you might again have seen Prince Jason and the Princess Medea, side by side, stealing through the streets of Colchis on their way to the sacred grove, in the centre of which the golden fleece was suspended to a tree. While they were crossing the pasture-ground, the brazen bulls came toward Jason, lowing, nodding their heads, and thrusting forth their snouts, which, as other cattle do, they loved to have rubbed and caressed by a friendly hand. Their fierce nature was thoroughly tamed, and with their fierceness the two furnaces in their stomachs had likewise been extinguished, insomuch that they probably enjoyed far more comfort in grazing and chewing their cuts than ever before. Indeed, it had heretofore been a great inconvenience to these poor animals that, whenever they wished to eat a mouthful of grass, the fire out of their nostrils had shriveled it up before they could manage to crop it. How they contrived to keep themselves alive is more than I can imagine. But now, instead of emitting jets of flame and streams of sulphurous vapour, they breathed the very sweetest of cow breath. After kindly patting the bulls, Jason followed Medea's guidance into the grove of Mars, where the great oak-trees that had been growing for centuries threw so thick a shade that the moonbeams struggled vainly to find their way through it. Only here and there a glimmer fell upon the leaf-strewn earth, or now and then a breeze stirred the boughs aside and gave Jason a glimpse of the sky, lest in that deep obscurity he might forget that there was one overhead. At length, when they had gone further and further into the heart of the duskiness, Medea squeezed Jason's hand. "'Look yonder,' she whispered. "'Do you see it?' Gleaming among the venerable oaks there was a radiance, not like the moonbeams, but rather resembling the golden glory of the setting sun. It proceeded from an object which appeared to be suspended at about a man's height from the ground, a little further within the wood. "'What is it?' asked Jason. "'Have you come so far to seek it?' exclaimed Medea. And do you not recognize the meed of all your toils and perils when it glitters before your eyes? It is the golden fleece. Jason went onward a few steps further, and then stopped to gaze. Oh, how beautiful it looked, shining with a marvelous light of its own, that inestimable prize which so many heroes had longed to behold, but had perished in the quest of it, either by the perils of their voyage or by the fiery breath of the brazen-lunged bulls. How gloriously it shines! cried Jason, in a rapture. It has surely been dipped in the richest gold of sunset. Let me hasten onward and take it to my bosom. Stay, said Medea, holding him back. Have you forgotten what guards it? To say the truth, in the joy of beholding the object of his desires, the terrible dragon had quite slipped out of Jason's memory. Soon, however, something came to pass that reminded him what perils were still to be encountered. An antelope that probably mistook the yellow radiance for sunrise came bounding fleetly through the grove. He was rushing straight toward the golden fleece, when suddenly there was a frightful hiss, and the immense head and half the scaly body of the dragon was thrust forth, for he was twisted round the trunk of the tree on which the fleece hung, and, seizing the poor antelope, swallowed him with one snap of his jaws. After this feat the dragon seemed sensible that some other living creature was within reach, on which he felt inclined to finish his meal. In various directions he kept poking his ugly snout among the trees, stretching out his neck a terrible long way, now here, now there, and now close to the spot where Jason and the princess were hiding behind an oak. Upon my word, as the head came waving and undulating through the air, and reaching almost within arm's length of Prince Jason, it was a very hideous and uncomfortable sight. The gape of his enormous jaws was nearly as wide as the gateway of the king's palace. "'Well, Jason,' whispered Medea, for she was ill-natured, as all enchantresses are, and wanted to make the bold youth tremble, "'what do you think now of your prospect of winning the golden fleece?' Jason answered only by drawing his sword and making a step forward. "'Stay, foolish youth,' said Medea, grasping his arm. Do not you see you are lost without me as your good angel? In this gold box I have a magic potion which will do the dragon's business far more effectually than your sword. The dragon had probably heard the voices, for, swift as lightning, his black head and forked tongue came hissing among the trees again, darting full forty feet at a stretch. 
as it approached, Medea tossed the contents of the gold box right down the monster's wide-open throat. Immediately, with an outrageous hiss and a tremendous wriggle, flinging his tail up to the tip-top of the tallest tree, and shattering all its branches as it crashed heavily down again, the dragon fell at full length upon the ground, and lay quite motionless. "'It is only a sleeping potion,' said the enchantress to Prince Jason. "'One always finds a use for this mischievous creature sooner or later, so I did not wish to kill him outright. Quick, snatch the prize and let us be gone. You have won the golden fleece.' Jason caught the fleece from the tree, and hurried through the grove, the deep shadows of which were illuminated as he passed, by the golden glory of the precious object that he bore along. A little way before him he beheld the old woman, whom he had helped over the stream, with her peacock beside her. She clapped her hands for joy, and beckoning him to haste, disappeared among the duskiness of the trees. Espying the two winged sons of the north wind, who were disporting themselves in the moonlight a few hundred feet aloft, Jason bade them tell the rest of the Argonauts to embark as speedily as possible. But Lynceus, with his sharp eyes, had already caught a glimpse of him, bringing the golden fleece, although several stone walls, a hill, and the black shadows of the grove of Mars intervened between. By his advice the heroes had seated themselves on the benches of the galley, with their oars held perpendicularly, ready to let fall into the water. As Jason drew near, he heard the talking image calling to him with more than ordinary eagerness, in his grave, sweet voice. "'Make haste, Prince Jason. For your life, make haste!' With one bound he leapt aboard. At sight of the glorious radiance of the golden fleece, the forty-nine heroes gave a mighty shout, and Orpheus, striking his harp, sang a song of triumph, to the cadence of which the galley flew over the water, homeward bound, as if careering along with wings.' 